then after some technical problems, you're most welcome. You have the audience and we also have three interesting experts that I'm very curious about. Uh, this uh, event is a kind of sneak preview uh, before uh, the opening of an exhibition that we, we are producing at the uh, Multicultural Center. Uh, this end of uh, September, we will open a new exhibition. I'm Michael Morby. I work with devel development issues here at the center, and I will try to come up with some reflecting questions, but uh, I think also uh, we can see if we have an audience, I think people are adding to this event the whole time, so it can come up with questions in the end. And I will say something a little bit, the theme today is, uh, is about oral history and ethics uh, in it, as a whole. Th I mean, uh, the proper title is to preserve memories, a conversation about oral history as culture legacy. And um, our exhibition we have, we, we have called We Are Neighbors, uh, and it's about uh, genocide and uh, uh, crimes against humanity, and it's localized in the municipality of Botkyrka, where our foundation is situated. So, in the process of preparing, uh, we have invited to this uh, talk today with three, um, I would say, experts, historians, historians, and I will uh, begin with Malin. To the book, you can see. Uh, just say right. I read on the Malin Tore Tureby. Please introduce you in a kind of shortly. Who are you and how you connect to this interesting field? Yeah, uh, I'm Malin. I'm um, I'm a historian, as Michael said, uh, historian and oral historian. I have been working with oral history through Hall, since I was a doctoral student. Um, and I have been researching with oral history, but I have also been researching how other, other researchers and memory institutions have used oral history in their research. Yeah, that was my short presentation. Yeah, I say short, and it was short. And then we go over to Stephen High, which is our international guest. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here from uh, Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada, and I think like most oral historians, I'm self-taught. I came to oral history as an undergraduate student, and I was hired by my hometown museum and to interview old people, and they gave me a bunch of cassettes, and they said, interview whoever you want, and I, and I fell in love with the practice, and it's been central to my, my work as an oral historian, as a historian at the university ever since, and I've seen think firsthand um, what it can do. You go over to Jesper. Who are you, Jesper? Yeah, I'm, I'm also trained as an historian. I did my doctorate about the Swedish uh, trade union movement, uh, the, the LO and uh, migration and integration policies and used uh, oral history methods in, to some extent there. Uh, then I've also, I've been, since a couple of years, I'm uh, employed as a senior lecturer in social work. So I'm, uh, I mean, in that sense, combining history, uh, history oral history with perspectives of, of um, social work, social policy, labor market studies and migration. Um, I've been working together with Marlin in, in some uh, projects where we, as Marlin was introducing before, where we have been um, looking at uh, cultural heritage institutions and their uh, practices of using oral history or other uh, collecting methods in uh, mostly by how they have been collecting different um, um, stories and, and narratives from, uh, from different uh, migrant groups uh, uh, from the 1970s and up to the 2010s. And we have published a book about that called uh, Migration and Cultural Heritage of Migration and Kultur in Swedish, uh, which I think was part of the reason why we also were invited. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the discussion together with all of you. 
So my first question, because is why is oral history so important? And I said it to people, to three people who, who work with these issues. But why, as a whole, in a broad sense, why is why is oral history important? It's something that we have forget to to do. I mean, do we? Because sometimes when I I look upon it, it seems that they are a lot going on, but that might not be the case. I don't know. What, what do you say, Marlene? What, what do you see the most, what, what so, why it is so, so important with oral history, which is kind of intangible in some ways? I'm talking like an historian then, an oral, oral historian and not someone working on a memory institution or a cultural heritage institution. Uh, I think oral history is important because um, it enables people to share their stories in, in their own words uh, and with their own voices uh, and through their and we get to know their understanding of what happened in the past but also have how it has affected the future lives and the consequences of what happened in the past and uh, I know that Stephen also have worked a lot with Henry Greenspan and so have I and I'm very inspired by by Hank's work and uh, as Hank says, a good interview is two persons working really hard trying to understand one uh, person's uh, life and experiences and that is the interviewees. Uh, and I think that is uh, why uh, oral history is important. It's, it, it's a new way or it's, it's a way of uh, trying to remembering and understanding and interpreting history uh, together. Mm. Do you agree, Jesper? Or yeah, um, I definitely agree with with the things Malin was saying. Uh, in many sense, I think we you can also add that oftenly, for many oral historians, at, at least traditionally, traditionally, I think there has also been an interest or uh, a way of trying to write history from below, uh, making uh, different groups, as Molly was saying, letting people uh, tell their stories with their own words. And, and in many senses, some of the groups that oral historian has been studying haven't been uh, highlighted in, in what we can say traditional his historical writing. So in that sense, the oral history uh, has given given boy being uh, they have been, been been able to to use their voice to to tell their own stories in that sense for instance about the women's movement labor market uh, uh, labor uh, workers uh, migrants and so on different communities of migrants and so on so that's an interesting perspective of our history at least i could say from the beginning in the in the 70s and in the 80s i would say those perspectives was most common in the way of, of arguing about the importance of oral history. And then the field has become much more diverse and, and, and uh, going in different directions. That, that perspective is still strong, but there are much more complexity to it as Malin was describing, I would say. So, yeah. Um, and of course, if, if we look from it, I mean, from a more of a traditional historical perspective, one can say that in that sense, uh, the oral sources, I mean, brings actually also some loosened facts to, to, to different, uh, I mean, historical processes. And when, when we uh, cost, uh, sh I mean, give highlight, hi or highlighting people from below in that sense. Yeah. Very good, Stephen. When we, we, you have worked a lot with the city of Montreal Right, I, I don't remember. I think the project work will call Montreal Life Story Stories Project. Is that right? Yeah. So um, Can you tell a little bit what what that was because it has sure. to be a, a place, a city. And... So, like like a lot of cities, Montreal is a uh, both a <laughs> a very local place, but also a very global place. And so, people have come around the world and have ended up in in Montreal. And many of those people have experienced. Um, mass violence in one way or another. And so it was a, a long-term collaborative project uh, with, you know, with these sort of survivor communities. And I think, I think oral history, I think one of the really interesting things is that it 
has really emerged out of the margins, right? Like whose stories actually get into the archives, right? Whose stories are often told and, uh, and whose stories are not told. And, and often migrants don't get, um, you know, are not really integrated in, into how we understand, you know, a city's past or a national past, right? Because these people have lived transnational lives. Um, and so, so in our project, it was very much a partnership. And so the survivor communities were, were co-researchers. They were on either side of the recording devices. Uh, they co-designed the project. Um, and so the project worked at multiple levels. It was a research project, but it was also a, a memory project um, where, uh, you know, in certain communities, you had a lot of silences, right? Where, where you know, between generations, where, where an older generation wouldn't talk about things, perhaps not wanting to sort of weigh down the next generation. Um, of course, the younger people had loads of questions, right? And so, and so the project was really about opening up spaces where, where you can have conversations, right? Reflections, and, and I think oral history has, a, it's, it's, its strength is really doing that, right? Like breaking silence, you know, finding connection between people. Um, and it also reminds us, I think, that, that, that history inhabits each of us. It's not just up there or out there. It doesn't belong to people with power and, you know, and so on, but actually is in our families and our communities and so on. And so, so it's a project, we, we record 500 life stories. Um, and then we, we created uh, live performances. So we had like a, about 10 uh, theater productions that came out of it, uh, art installations, uh, metro cars, so subway cars had uh, digital, you know, storytelling sort of QR code as people can sort of connect with story. Um, digital stories online, animated film. So people, you know, so so it was opening up spaces for people to to listen, right? To to sort of listen to other people's stories in a way that we don't normally get that chance, right? To really listen to other people and and perhaps listening across difference, right? People unlike yourself and and finding connection, you know, while doing that. I think that is politically really important, but also I think important in terms of, you know, scholarship and so on. Um, yeah, so I can go on, but I, I, I uh, yeah, so it was a longer term project. And I think, I think, again, I think good projects take time. Um, Malin mentioned uh, Hank Greenspan, right? And I think, you know, he's worked with the same group of Holocaust survivors for like 40 years, right? Not everyone can do that. <laughs> But I think there, there's huge value in, in, in taking time and listening. And we don't do enough of that, I think, in, in the world. And, or reduce people to certain problems, right, that have to be fixed somehow, right? Instead of actually being more open and just listening to people's you know, life, life experience, right? Which changes how we perceive and ourselves in the process, I think. Do these questions about, you know, like our theme is genocide and, and, and uh, say human right violence, uh, violations and so, do these questions, dark, dark stories, do they come up often when you have done, oops, something happened. I, I think when you do, when you are in the city and you choose those kind of tough, Subjects is my questions. Are they coming uh, usually when you, you you have open questions about life stories, or is it is it something that because in our case we come with tough tough thematics and say, can you tell us about it? Because my question is that's an eth ethic uh, part in this. I mean, you come with, with something that is might open up for a, uh, for a lot of challenges issue, challenging issues. Uh, someone who wants to reflect on that, or Stephen, or did you, could you said, yeah, I think I read somewhere that you said a lot of story, you have worked with, with violence in the city. Can you say something that, about what, what that was, it made me curious. Well, our, our approach to interviewing was uh, a life story. And so I, I think there's different kinds, different ways to interview, right? You can do like a testimony kind of interview where you're only interested in the violence. So in a way you're not interested in the person, you're interested in what they have to say about that, you know, capital mm -hmm. H history. And, and so it's that eyewitness. And so in those kinds of interviews, it begins and ends with the violence. 
the life story interview, you're interested in in the whole sort of life course and 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 to and to understand that violence and what that means for people, you have to understand the before and the after, right? Um, and you and you realize in doing that that you know the impact of that violence doesn't just sort of happen and it's over. It ripples outward, right, through individual lives, uh, families, you know, generations, and and that experience of say Rwanda 1994 and that genocide is still very present in people's lives, right? And and so to me, by by just reducing it to that you know, the eyewitness on what happened in those 100 days in, in Rwanda, you're actually reducing you know the profound impact on people's lives. Um, at the same time, I think a life story approach um, decenters the violence, right? That, it, you know, my students are always surprised at how much laughter and how much joy are in these interviews with genocide survivors, right? These are life stories. And so, and so yes, there are hard stories in there, right? There's pain, uh, there's all kinds, there's a range of emotions and those emotions don't always surface in the place that you expected, right? It can surface in places where you think are maybe less sensitive, right? Often closer to home when people talk about their children and what they tell their children, that's often very emotional. Um, and so I think, I think, I think I like that too, because you know, if you reduce people to the pain they experience, are, are, you, are you ending up dehumanizing them, right? Um, people are more complex than that and, and, and they live full lives and there's also resilience, all these things that we can learn from that, that wider lens. And so, and so our interviews were life story interviews. You know, they were multiple session interviews. Um, so we'd go back, right? And so they'd range from like five hours to 20 hours each. And I think that is also an ethical practice because you know, I think so much of research is very extractive, like mining. You go in, you take, you leave, and, and they don't hear from you ever again, right? Whereas if you build in a practice that of, of, of more of a collaborative practice where you go back with people and you actually have that conversation and, you, and if it's a bigger project, you can invite them into the project itself. Um, to me, that, 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 that deepens the conversation, but also ends up being a much more ethical process, right? Um, uh, and I think more, more, more politically powerful as a result, um, again, it raises all kinds of questions in doing that, ethical questions too, right? What's on the record, what's off the record, um, you know, who, you know, <laughs> who's the author, you know, all these things, right? Um, but I think collaborative work actually, you know, these complications are good things, right? Because it means you're actually, you know, blurring the old ways of doing things, right? Where you have like, here's the researchers over in one corner and here's the researched over another. And to me, you know, that you end up with like this academic gaze, which is very, you know, all consuming and very confident uh, often. Whereas something that's messier to me ends up being more reflexive, right? You're, you're more aware of the power dynamics. You're aware of your own sort of positionality, right? You're, where, you know, where you stand and how you see things is not necessarily the same as the person beside you. Um, anyways, um, and so I think, I think increasingly oral history is, 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 is in that space, just like the interview itself is that conversation between, is that back and forth, a dialogic between, you know, experiential authority, I was there, you know, I'm going to tell you how it really was with with that sort of more distant authority of the expert or the interviewer. And it's that back and forth. And ideally to me, a project would have that too, right? That back and forth and that, and that sort of listening across difference to me is really, really uh, modeling the kind of society that you actually want, right? <laughs> anyway. I have a question for Marlin because Marlin, you were an expert in this uh, process of uh, creating a museum of genocide, or what, what do you call it, and, and I read an article that you said that some of the, I mean, of the, the goal, uh, or the goal will be to build on, on this, the, the oral history, or I mean, collecting stories. And you, I, as I interpreted it, you, you said most of the stories were collected in, for, for uh, trials and, 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 and witnesses for, for, for a, a more of a, a justice and so and you were questioning i mean could you, could you 
tell a little about how you see upon stories that were, were collected like 50 years ago and used for a museum uh, that will might be to come in Stockholm if we visit uh, the, Holocaust, the Holocaust Museum. Yeah, I, I don't recognize this with the with the old interviews, but I can talk about that also. But I worked as an ex expert in the investigation uh, of how to to establish the new Holocaust Museum, uh, and and this is my own uh, point of view. Then, uh, because the government decided that the museum will be will be built upon um uh, the survivor stories or recounting or testimonies as they call them uh, but the way i i think <laughs> and once again very inspired by hank greenspan i think oral history is not only about uh, collecting testimonies or life stories so if we want to build this holocaust museum um, for and together with the survivors the few survivors that we still are still among us but their uh, descendants i think we need to go into sustained conversations uh, with them about how we want to build uh, this holocaust museum because for me oral history is not as steven also i think we're talking about doing the interview it's keep on <laughs> keep on having this conversation and of course we can do interviews with the few survivors that we uh, have left but we can also you know we have a lot of uh, old Holocaust collections in Sweden that have never ever been put into to use and a lot of those people are now gone but their children and grandchildren are still am among us and we can talk with them about how they want their uh, parents or grandparents uh, life stories to be used in this new Holocaust museum because here we have an ethical question a lot of the old uh, Holocaust collections that we do have in Sweden they were uh, collected without informed consent Mm -hmm. So we don't know if we now can, for example, uh, digitize them or use them in the Holocaust Museum because the people who, um, some of the survivors in Sweden also, they collected their own stories. I think that is also something that is important uh, to remember that uh, why do they need us? Because a lot of survivors have actually been actively memory activists that they have been collecting and documenting what was going on during the genocide or the Holocaust or the mass violence on their own. And they have been keep on telling the stories for themselves in, in, and in their communities. Uh, and I think we need to uh, honor all the work that they have done themselves, uh, but also we need to do this in an ethical way that is okay, both for the survivors, but also for the descendants that, uh, and we, have to keep the conversation going. And I think that is also what a uh, difference between what you can do at your institution, uh, Michael, with doing this collection and what I can do as a researcher at the university, because even if I get funding, I get funding for maybe three years. So even if I want to have <laughs> a program that goes on forever, like Hank, and talk to people for 40 years, I, I guess yeah, I will never get that funding, but an institution, one can hope will be there for a longer time so you keep, can keep on collecting or creating those stories together uh, with survivors and you can keep on having this conversation with them on how they want their stories to be used in the future and in 20 years you can talk with the children of them how how do you want us to use your parents stories now and do you want to add something to the story do you want to alter the story have you a new interpretation of what happened or new thoughts on what happened and I don't know if I answered your question. I was yeah, just yeah, yeah. <laughs> because to me, it's for me, it's like it's a lot of like kind of learning and communication and like, you know, kind of that's a skill that both the academics and the people who works with, with the things might be able to work on. I mean, like a conversation about those, those things and to do because and I mean, learning together, I think, also is very yeah. important. As a cool, what is it? Doing it together, learning together, learning together, yeah. and that that might be a, a big ch challenge because then it's also because my question be, I mean, an exhibition. How, how do you an optimal exhibition on these issues? What 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 might that, that be? Is that a place where you have ongoing conversation talks and programs? What I think we talk about, a lot, Stephen, with you that you. That's something that you have to have resources for though, and, and to work over time, as you said, Molly, to, to, to be that place. Uh, 
Yes, but do you agree with this dimension of, of uh, the, this multi-dimension of, of how stories can be taken care of? And... Yeah, I think so. I, and I agree with both Marlon and Stephen, I mean, about this sort of uh, uh, common learning and, and, and the sort of mutual uh, learning processes and, and the continuing discussions. And I think that uh, may be also, of course, be possible when it comes to the exhibition or representation uh, aspects of it, since I mean, why I mean, people could definitely be be included or integrated when it comes to how to raise questions and design the projects. They can be included when it comes to the interpretation. They can be included in the writing. So why can't they be included in 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 the way how people? I mean, how we present. Uh, our research or uh, our, our um, museum findings in that sense that they could be part of the interpretation and, and be uh, be a common conversation partner, even even in the, how, how things are presented. And, and today with, with all these, I mean, digital techniques, I mean, you can, uh, as we do now, record the conversations and, uh, and then, uh, play them and, and represent them in the museums. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities for those sorts of common and mutual conversations, even when it comes to museums, mm -hmm. definitely. Do you think that the Swedish museums sh should work more on, on more intelligent, I mean, or with oral histories and, and develop that as a, a way of making museums more uh, Contemporary, or what do you think? Three oral historians will <laughs> will answer to that. <laughs> leading questions. <laughs> the leading question, but they are do definitely. They have, I mean, my question: be, Do they have the skills today? Do you <clears> think <throat> it's, it's happening? Um, I mean, I, I it would be false of me of saying. I mean, I I'm not. I mean, I don't have the full uh, full knowledge of of all museums and then the. Competence around the Swedish National Museums, but maybe, of course, there, there could be uh, more of, of education and training together with and in collaborative projects with oral historians in making those sorts of, of, of collecting projects and exhibitions and so on. But definitely, I think it's, I mean, of course, it's possible since, I mean, if we just go to the thing what Stephen was saying, he started as uh, an autodidactics, and I think a lot of people, uh, researchers doing oral history has done that. And I, that would be definitely be possible also for, for um, different people representing museums. But, but since there, today, I think uh, we have that uh, advantage that there, there, there are a lot of uh, trained museum, uh, museum people and, and oral historians from the academia who can also be uh, consult, uh, uh, consults and, and experts who can, can I mean, be collaborating with, with different museums, not not as the experts, but as conversation partners uh, in that sense. So definitely. I think one of the challenges is that, you know, like museums are also, you know, there's certain expectations about what a museum does and, and where that expert authority sort of is. And um, when museums try to do something different, sometimes they get sort of pushed down. And I'm thinking of the Museum of, of Movements in, in, in Sweden, where, where they were really trying to develop a, a different kind of paradigm of what a museum is. And, it's, and, it's, and really sort of try to you know, reinvent its relationship to, you know, to diasporic communities, which to me is really, it was really brave um, in many ways, and and yet, <laughs> you know, uh, they didn't get the the support um, in the end from from the government, and and so I think, you know, I think it's great that the multicultural center is is is, is doing this kind of thing. I think oral history allows different kinds of institutions to sort of um, be interpreters of this history and to be um, guardians of this history and to be initiators or catalysts and so on. And I do think that that often, you know, the most innovative work occurs on the margins, and I think that's also the institutional margins, right? Because they don't, you know, they they're not there's not the structures or the expectations or you know in the same way. And again, I think you see the same thing in the academy, in the academy as well. 
I don't think it's just, you know, either or. Um, yeah. When, when it comes to build local trust in a, in, a, in a world of when you have a multicultural situation, like in Bootschirka, you have people come from all over the world and you have also things happen in the past, but you also have things happening now when it comes to, 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 to genocide. And so do you think this is one entrance to, to building trust to work with this as an entrance to, to, to to have people to talk with each other, both the people who experience it, but, but also to communicate to, to the neighbors, because we have chosen that we are neighbors, and sometimes you were neighbors that couldn't, couldn't live with each other. But what do you think about the trust building aspects of oral history? Is it a romanticization from my side, or is it something that we could work when it comes to what you said before? It's something that we can use in these times when people... I don't think it's a romanticization, but I think, uh, as Stephen has underlined, oral history is also a lot of hard work. So uh, this trust building takes time. <laughs> so I think if you want to go for that approach, you have to start now. And I was just wondering, Michael, maybe you are not the, the right person to ask, but how much have you involved the, the community is in Botkyrka in this new exhibition? We are neighbors. Are, are they are they part of it from the beginning? Uh, we are collecting stories. I, I can I can see myself that they are are part of of the, the production just now. But we are not. We are also in. I think we're going to have a, an, a, what to say, a reference group, I think Nadia will work with, or my colleague. So, but uh, I think we could have done more when, when we start, started with this project, because the more I listen to, to experience, like, like Steven and I, we talked with Tal like two, two months ago, I think, I think that aspect is very important. And I think also that that's also in my question that you have to work with also during the exhibition. That's that's an opening exhibition. As I mean, you we can't cover everything in in, in an exhibition. And uh, and we, we uh, so my answer will be we. I think we would gonna the co-creation aspect of, of of this conversation space. We have to work on that during the whole period of the exhibition. Yeah, yeah I think and maybe that, that conversation can turn into a, another exhibition. Just yeah, that's sorry. that's right. If you because that I think the center that has all I mean we 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 ba we based on on the end the interest for what is going on on in Bochirka, but also what is going on in Bochirka is going on in the whole world and also in this in Sweden. So, but it 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 was from the beginning very much based on ethnography and observation and and, 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 and I mean. That that field and so when now we I think we almost thirty five years old institution and municipality institution so that to be there over time has as you said is very important because then you you have uh, material in the archives that you can use when you want to produce something new but you can also then have ethnographers out to to, to collecting new new stories and also that dimension of uh, uh, programs and that we are in interspace a place for, for conversation that is very important but otherwise as you said Marlin then it would be a project for some years and you I think I, I think my my experience of, of, of the academic field is, is not that it did so it's not so much many opportunities to to have exhibition but it's, it's getting better I think the, the, you work with art and have exhibitions and so but to be there over time, as you said, it's important for us, I think, because I think this, to remember migration started 2008 and we had produced some books, but we also a lot of um, uh, events, but also we have uh, what we call writing circles to, to uh, support people who wants to write or to tell the story. I think that's a challenge also. That's my opinion in that this is a challenge to, to to come to the local communities and say, uh, we have some sub genocide and, and break, I said, can you come? Because then you have to build trust in the beginning. Why should I share my, my experience with, 
to this institution. So then it's good to have been there on over time, I think. But that's my reflection on so building trust is something you can do, but you can also lose it if you if you do something wrong. Uh, Jesper. I won't I won't argue that I mean that you are you I think that you are doing the, the wrong uh, theme or so for the exhibition but but as Steven say, uh, said before maybe perhaps it's easier to to reach out to people uh, if they have the, the opportunity to to tell more of their whole life stories since I think as you were saying it's it's tricky and hard perhaps to to approach people with with such a, a hard subject I mean, just to come to somebody and uh, send them a letter asking, can we interview you about, I mean, your experiences of, of, of a genocide or of, of mass violence and so on. Perhaps it's easier if you build that trust and, and I mean, uh, make a, a broader uh, approach to it. And then I think people will, will come into those things since they have been very important for their lives. Uh, mm -hmm. And in their interpretation of their of their lives and how they, I mean, uh, look at their uh, contemporary life and in and, and their future uh, prospects and so on. So, but I mean, in that sense, I think it's easier to 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 approach so such uh, hard things. But I mean, of, but I mean, uh, it it would be wrong of me and, fa and falsely to, to to have opinions about I mean your your um, exhibition I think it's it's a great idea also so but I'm um, but it was more a question of how the problem you you are experiencing in, in approaching people and so on and, and get access to them and so on mm -hmm. yeah, I, think I think it depends I think it depends a little bit on you know where the idea comes from right like in our context you know the communities did want to spot speak about those hard things you know to counter denial or to um, heal sort of this festering wound within within their communities and so on. So each community in a way had like a, a different reason perhaps to 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 engage, you know, uh, in a project around mass violence. Um, and so to me the you know in any in any kind of project or process, it's really like, you know, who it's that it's that initial stage of conceptualization and you know, we're going to do this project we're going to do this exhibition like whose decision is that right where is that coming from and so to me you know a, a truly collaborative process you know it's really that beginning stage that's crucial otherwise you're inviting people into your process right which is always going to be you know is more distance than to bridge in a way right to try to make it our project not just my project um um, but I, I, and I also, I was going to say that I think a good process has, has multiple outcomes in a way, like if you have like a project with only one outcome, it puts a lot of pressure on that outcome to sort of reach everyone, do everything, say everything and so on. If you think of it as a process that has, you know, different things that are sort of resulting and that, you know, even that main outcome, say it's an exhibition, it's not the end, it's the beginning, it's a platform for other conversations, right, or a next stage, you know, on this road that you're on. Uh, and I do think in the academy, we do have like, you know, shim, like in French, we say chemin, like roads, you know, so I have a project, it takes me so far down a certain road, right, and then other projects will sort of, you know, grow out of that. And, and so there is sort of a, a chemin that happens even though the funding only takes us perhaps you know a certain way and i think institutions can do that outside the academy um but it takes sort of you know a wider conversation you know it takes sort of a, an openness but also direction <laughs> right and a longer term view right uh about what you know what your purpose is i guess right what are you what are you trying to do yeah. i think also, I mean, next spring I will be responsible for, for, for a conference when I want to mix then academics and also NGOs and people, politicians also, to reflect on, on what history and the, mem as a, the politics of memories, what, what that is also to, to be, I mean, my goal will be to be totally, I mean, to see, have a, uh, something that we can mutual learning about what we are doing, what are the, the purpose of our different roles in, in, in those times. And as I said, like, I, I think we could discuss trust building, but also the dimension of 
can we prevent those things to happen again, for example, is by uh, doing exhibitions or travel to places where there has been genocide. Okay, so that's, that's, that's my goal for, for that, but I think also it, it shouldn't end by next spring. I think that's something that we, we need to continue within the framework of to, make, to, to, to remember migration. That's my personal opinion also. I read an article about archivists. I, I, do you use that, archivists? Is that something that everybody's told? What, what is this <laughs> representation with the archives and so so? But, but it's something that is used today, archivists. Can you tell me a little bit what it, I, I, I think it was Twin Historisk Museet in Sverige som skrev med en bok om arkivism. Is that used for different, for different like group who is not in the archives or what, what is archivism? Or perhaps this is obvious, I don't know. I'm not sure the context you're saying, like are you, are you meaning like, um community-based archives like trying to um i'm not sure how you what you mean by archivist you know an archivist or an archivism but there's a whole community archives movement right where especially marginalized communities like like where they're they're trying to um so in a way like these these kinds of records that say, community groups produce like for example your multicultural center this is your this is your sort of institutional memory, right? And and so how do we, or social movements or you know, whatever, and how can we ensure that these stories are still in circulation? Because they go to a state archive, sometimes they're just, you know, that conversation is suspended, right? Um, you know, it's it's then the preserve of, of researchers. It's, it's sort of, its role within living communities is sort of, you know, sort of dead. And so I think there is a movement to sort of think about the relationship between archives and sort of the communities that generate them. And I think it's the same with oral history, right? Like, like the show of visual history foundation, you know, 55,000 interviews uh, done in the, done in, in the nineties, you know, who actually listened to those for the longest time. Right. And so I think Matt Mellon was saying this, that, that uh, you know, we can point to it. We can say there was 55,000 interviews there, but, but they weren't actually, you know, the power of those interviews is actually the, you know, the power of listening to those stories. And so, and so how do you activate, right? How do you activate these stories uh, to ensure that they're circulated in a way that allows, you know, and, and shared, right? In a way that allows people to listen and to learn. And again, and also listen across difference. I'm really big on that. I think this is, we don't do enough of that. And, and you know, social media is such a, <laughs> you know, a, a narrow uh, bandwidth, um, and then everyone else seems crazy. <laughs> right. And and so how how do we actually bridge these things to try to, you know, and break down some of these, you know, these abstractions that end up, you know, dividing us further. Um, um, Sean Field in South Africa, he's a great oral historian, he talks about, he rejects the idea that oral history can heal you as, as somehow like, telling your story is gonna be good for you because it, it may be good for you or maybe the worst thing you ever did, right? It really depends. Um, but he talks about social regeneration, right? So in the context of mass violence or forced migration, you know, the, the ties that sort of bound people together are, are, are torn apart, right? And so he talks about how sharing stories allows you to sort of reconnect, you know, across generations or what have you. And, and so this idea I find really useful and, and that certainly was a big motivating thing in our project. So like the, the Rwandan community, you know, they organized a, an intergenerational day of remembering where within their community and they had 150 people there all day and people were listening to stories, sharing stories. Uh, they had like a, a timeline in the front wall, like from 1945 to the present. And all day people had like a pile of like memory cards. They'd write down the memory and a date. They go up and they, they stick it onto this wall of memory, right? And so the end, you had a wall of memory, all these colorful cards. And, and so this is to me an act of going from the individual to the collective. It's an act of regeneration in a context of a community that is badly divided, you know, ethnicity, generation, who was in Rwanda in 1994, who wasn't in Rwanda in 1994. 
And so I do think oral history can be a catalyst in really, in really powerful ways. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question at all. Yeah, but it seems like <laughs> you tried all kind of different ways of, of, of creating or, and also communicate mm. and also, I mean, but is this something that has spread to many places and cities today? Is it, is it, is it the way of working that you, I think, uh, Stephen, that you said it's a lot of projects you said, I think, when we had a talk. Mm -hmm. Like, I was in Birmingham tw 12 years ago in Birmingham, Birmingham Stories, that was also part of the work with the library and also collecting stories and also who is a, a, a person from Birmingham. So, but that might be all over the world. Is that your you as it is it all over the world that you work I and mean, places work with oral history as a way of yeah let's say it's something briefly but before but like Malin was, was saying is it Malin or Malin uh, sorry uh, oh, yeah. uh <laughs> um but you, you she was saying that it's a lot of hard work right yeah. like and and I think a lot of these kinds of story sharing projects are very short term very earnest well meaning but in the end very superficial because they don't you know that they're not sustained right and these things take time and so i i really believe that you need to sort of think about projects that build on each other and you got to think about this is there's no quick fixes right but there's a there's a you know a sustained conversation so it ends up being like 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 ken greenspan at 30 years with a group of holocaust survivors but you can you can try as an organization say in a in a locality to open up that space for for a long-term conversation around issues that that are you know very you know very real and very demanding and very difficult uh, but not just limiting ourselves to those things like that water sort of life story i think is really really crucial so I, i'll stop talking right anyone yeah yes yeah i i am i think uh, i mean it's kind of uh, common in, in different cities around the world, but I would say that we in Sweden are a little bit not, it's not that common in Sweden uh, doing those sorts of projects. Malmö, as Stephen were describing before with the movements, uh, uh, the Museum of Movements, I mean, that was a try. And, and there's still um, uh, efforts to, to do things like that in Malmö. Uh, but of course, things have become more complicated after uh, downturn of uh, the Museum of Movements. I think Marlin can say more about that. But I think one thing, I I mean, a suggestion I would, I would tell you about, uh, I mean, the projects you are into now when, when you are, I mean, collecting stories to your, um, your exhibition. One thing that I, me and Marlin, a result of my, me and Marlin's uh, research together when we were uh, researching about the collecting processes of the, the collections of different migrant groups at the Nordic Museum and also the Multicultural Center was that there's, there has been a lack of uh, what we can say documentation about the, pro the processes. How, how was these projects conducted? What sort of motives, what sort of conditions, uh, what sort of processes were driving these sorts of, of uh, collecting uh, projects. And I would say that, that that would be very interesting to collect these sorts of metadata who can give an understanding for all the people who are visiting your exhibitions. How can we understand these stories? How can we understand this initiative in relation to what, which sorts of actors have been of importance and so on? That would be a, a great value if people would be able to get back in uh, in several years and use the material, reuse the material to understand the exhibition, the material you collected and so on. That would be a, a great value if you try to document those things when, you, when you're working together or doing this project, I would say. That's a, that's a suggestion at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Marlin, do we want to comment on what we Yeah, just a, a short uh, comment. I, I think like the Museum of Movement was very successful in, in uh, creating these community-based uh, uh, activities and it was a, a lot of hard work. They were not successful in, in getting the government to, to fund the museum then, but they were very successful in their processes and we are trying now to 
uh, learn uh, from them and taking some of it in to, to the university in Malmö uh, also and continue to work, work with the communities in Malmö. Uh, however, I think also I've been thinking a lot about that because um, uh, I'm very inspired about community-based oral history as it has been done in North America or, or also in the UK. But I also think it's hard to translate it <laughs> to a Swedish context because we don't even have a word in Swedish for community. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how to translate that. So people are not identifying in the same way as belonging to communities. The Museum of Movements might have been working it because it goes for it. Movement can be migration, but it can also be like the labor movement, the women's movement, other parts of movements. But and that is something that I am so impressed by the Museum of Movements because in a way they started to make people in Malmö feeling and thinking on those community based uh, also it, it was yeah it was marvelous what was going on in Malmö and, and I think it still is continuing actually although the museum will not happen all this work in the communities are continuing so so you they taking care of, of, of the experiences and so as yeah. you, as, you as at university as well then? And, and not so much me at the university, yeah. but, but Robert yeah. Nielsen yeah. Mohammed, who is uh, working with this uh, Malmö Life Stories project, for mm -hmm. example, that is, yeah, Stephen knows about it also. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I was thinking if we can let some, if someone listening or listen or have a, a question or try, uh, I don't know, I see just names, but uh, <laughs> someone who you can, you can, I think you can write a question also in the chat if you have any. No, yeah. Uh, can I ask a question, Mikke? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, my name is Anna. I used to work at uh, MKC um, a few years ago, uh, and I am now doing my own research in the peace building in Northern Ireland. Um, and I was thinking about this quite a lot uh, when I'm listening to you, because here we talk so much about the contested memories uh, and about the, the challenges of uh, using oral history with uh, the contested narratives and experiences, and especially on a paramilitary conflict, uh, as in Northern Ireland. So I would just, and I was thinking this might be interesting to just hear your your thoughts on this, as that this might also affect, I guess, the collection collection of stories, Mickey, for you for the for the exhibition this spring. I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I can jump in, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I think oral history, I think one of its great powers is that it complicates categories, right? Um, although it can also reify them depending on your project design. So I often tell my students, like, don't interview one person from this group of people, one person from this category, one, from, one person from this other category. Because what they'll then, what you're then doing is putting them into the position of being a spokesperson for that category, right? Which flattens all kinds of cross currents and contestation within, right? And exaggerates without. And so you want clusters of of, of stories that allow us to sort of um, deepen our understanding of, of real divides. There are structural divides, there are political divides. History unites us, but history divides us. Um, and we see that in Northern Ireland uh, in, a, in a big way. Um, there's an interesting Northern Ireland project called the Prisons Memory uh, Project, which um, <clears throat> interviewed people tied to the, you know, who were, um, you know, jailed, you know, and, and people around them. So like family members and so on. And you go to their website, it's interesting because you don't know who's a loyalist and who's a nationalist. You know, they're not like put into these two categories and so it forces you to actually listen and then only then by listening to actually locate you know locate them you know politically or whatever and i think i think playing i, I think that was a really interesting and i think a really subversive thing because so often people are sort of placed you know put in a place right by 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 the water politics and so i think oral history can you know, subvert that or complicate that in, I think, really, really good ways that 
that allow us to sort of think about our, our shared humanity politically. Um, again, not to deny the real structural divisions or are very real political divisions and, and history is always contested. Um, absolutely. Any other comments? No. And now the questions from, uh, I didn't know whether what you, Anna, I saw you just Anna, I, don't, I didn't know what you, my former colleague here at the center, who is in Ireland for the moment. Uh, any other question? No. Uh, I have a question. Uh, question. Uh, this is Tal. Uh, what is the responsibilities of institutions, museums, and other? when collecting or having conversation about traumatic memories like this, what kind of responsibilities do we have, do you think? Thanks. And it's open for anyone. I can start and you can add. <laughs> because you have a lot of responsibilities, I think. Uh, first of all, uh, I think this with the informed consent uh, is very uh, important that you communicate and uh, discuss with the persons that you are creating and collecting the stories uh, from, that they know what, what the purpose are and also that they have a say in how they will be used uh, in the exhibition, but also in the archive. Uh, and as also this with the sustained conversation, even if you have an informed consent, if you are an institution, uh, I would say that it also, it's a recommendation that if you reuse the materials, that you ask the persons once again, if they are okay with you reusing this material in a new exhibition, if they want to add something, if they want to, you know, you not to use it again. So it, that it's uh, a living conversation uh, and an ethical uh, responsibility that, that, that doesn't end uh, actually. Yes, Bear. One thing I would like to add when I was preparing <laughs> this conversation and which also give reference to what Stephen was saying before, uh, one thing I think is quite important is, uh, I mean, which, which also some previous research has shown. I mean, the way of letting people talk about other things, I mean, and how you uh, approach them so that people, so they have the opportunity to, to tell other things and, I mean, present themselves in a more multi-dimensional way. Otherwise, it's, I mean, it's a risk that you end up with just putting people in, in sort of one dimensional social categories just as survivors of, of uh, mass violence or uh, of, um, uh, uh, of and, and different sorts of traumas. I mean, of course, people has experienced traumas and have, have interpreted and have positioned themselves and identified themselves in relation to that, but they are much more, multi, people are much more multidimensional. So, try to avoid too much of that sorts of specific categorization of people in that sense. Try to be a little, a little bit more open, letting people talk and write about other things. You will get to those things anyhow, I think. Thanks. I guess I would add that, that and I think those are really, really great points. And I, I think one thing I'd add would be like to listen to the interviews that you've recorded. Um, and um, we just saw in, in Ireland, you know, the mother and baby homes uh, inquiry um, where it just came out that <laughs> didn't listen to 500 interviews, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so of course the families are appalled, right? Like, like you know, like their, their whole, it's denying sort of the validity of their experience and yet, yet they collected those stories. Um, and in Canada, we had a, a similar thing with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission around uh, residential schools and Indigenous people where uh, they collected thousands of interviews. They had no way to actually listen to those interviews. And so 
And so I think sometimes we get caught up in the idea that we have to do a whole lo lot of interviews, right? Because it's an important issue and to show it's important, we're gonna interview a lot of people so that we can point to that number. It's more important to listen, right? To those stories and, 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 and to have the capacity to listen and that whatever you then produce should be founded on deep listening, right? Not just sort of, um, you know, finding some like juicy quotes that fit what you think you're gonna, what you think is the story you wanna tell, right? It has to sort of come from below. To me, that, that, that's a sign of respect, right? That's a sign of listening to those people's stories. And that too takes time, right? And that takes a commitment that you're, you know, that, that you are, you know, you have a responsibility there. And it's that responsibility to, to those people who have had the courage, right? And the trust, right? To share their stories with you. Um, and so again, I think you, you, you have to think through your process, right? Uh, right from that out, uh, out, you know, that beginning point. Um, and, and you have to deliver on that process, right? Whether it's, it's questions of consent or harm, right? Like how do you, how do you ensure that, that you're not going to hurt people further, right? By, by perhaps interviewing in a very, you know, undelicate or uncaring way, or perhaps it's, 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 it's then going public with their stories in a way that, that could be hurtful. Um, and so again, collaboration to me is a way to strengthen that process, right? To ensure that people are, are with you on that journey, right? And that helps you with like the decisions that we all make in interpreting, right? People's stories. Um, and sometimes that means maybe disagreeing with interviewees, like in terms of the wider interpretation, right? Like, like in, in North America, we talk about sharing authority, right? Trying to have a process that's co-created, but sharing authority isn't about abdicating your voice entirely. It's about being accountable for, for your voice and your interpretation. Um, and so I think these are, these are all things that, that are important, um, but also like, I guess, like thinking say an exhibition, like where are you taking people to, right? So in our context, looking at mass violence, we didn't want to locate the violence only outside of Canada, right? Because then it's like, oh, we come to Canada, it's a, <laughs> it's a land of perfect, you know, no violence here, right? And so, and so, and so thinking about politically what you're doing, right, uh, as a project or as, a, as an exhibition and, and being transparent about that, which I think was Jesper's point earlier, right, uh, in terms of your exhibition, like showing a bit about the making, right, like showing, a, like showing your hand, right, your interpretive hand, so it's not just, you know, invisible, makes it's a way of making you accountable right for for the interpretations you're making um so i, I think it's imperfect and it's not you know you're going to make mistakes uh and it's going to be messy but it's about being constantly asking yourself the hard questions right so you're constantly learning right and hopefully always you know doing better as a result right um that would be my my two cents thank you so much for your answers they were great I I plan to end this discussion because I think we have like one hour. So if you because I think yeah, we had a very interesting discussion, and I, I mean at least I'm more and more curious curious, uh, and I would like to cooperate with you for the next uh, spring when we know more about how our process went and that the exhibition will be on place and September we will have had the experience of some programming and so, but it would be great to, to go on and do something to, more together, at least from my side. Can I ask a question of my co-panelists? Like, I, I, I want to know more about your work. And I, 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 you mentioned you did a report on, like, um, on, on how cultural institutions work with oral history. I, I love to know, like, what were some of the takeaways of that? Like, I, I, that's really important work that you're doing and, and not enough people are doing that kind of thing anywhere. So I, 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 if we can have like two more minutes, I'm not sure if we can push it that far, but I, I love to hear a bit more from Jesper and, and uh, Melin uh, about, uh, about that report and just, you know, what you've learned from other people's mistakes and, and also triumphs, I guess, right? Yeah. Come on, Jesper. Will you begin, Molly? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, how shall I begin? <laughs> Our book is, is about the, the Nordic Museum in, in Stockholm. And we were interested in how they have been um, collecting uh, interviews or live stories from different migrant groups in Sweden. So we started in the 1970s uh, with a big collection they did on, on Finnish migrants. And then we moved uh, towards uh, the time we're living in, uh, in now. But we also found it very hard because um, we are historians and oral historians and the Nordic Museum is a, a museum where mainly ethnologists have been working and they have their way of working. And uh, when I was presenting, for example, the findings, because we, we did find what we troublesome things that, for example, you, but it's also during the 1970s, you did uh, oral history or ethnology in, in a certain way and they were, you can say that they objectify the persons uh, that they are doing the interviews uh, uh, with. But also one of my colleagues asked me, why are you, why are you looking for, you know, collaboration, shared authority? And then I just realized also that I'm walking into this archive now, like an oral historian and expecting them to work with the methods we are working with as uh, oral historians. So I also think it was also, uh, for Jesper and me, it was also learning to listen uh, in the ways they were working and, and respecting the way, actually, and how their discipline has uh, developed in, in ethnology uh, also, and learning from that also, because this uh, in the beginning, we were very critical of this big uh, collection from the 1970s with the, uh, remem- uh, it's called Migration uh, Sweden-Finland. But now I'm so impressed by the collection also. There are so many mistakes in it, but it's also such a rich collection. They did interviews, they took photos, they did sketches of people's homes. So it's really like uh, you have like a memory of Sweden in the 1970s, but also a memory of how you conducted ethnographical work in the 1970s. So it's, it's more a history of how doing uh, oral history and also you can see how when politics change uh, and they get certain uh, when the government uh, for example pushing new policies how that also uh, affects uh, what and how they can work at the museum hmm. we, we can uh, unfortunately unfortunately but i mean the, the book is written in in in, in, in swedish but we have uh, published uh, a few articles during the way, so we, maybe we can send you by through email. Uh, 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 and I, I mean, in, in some way, we, we can say that it's 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 based on two parts. That one is that we were, as Malin was describing, knew that how how the the museum, the Nordic Museum, were doing their collecting processes, what methods, uh, and so on. But also, of course, uh, analysis of the of the life stories or, or the interviews and the, the narratives. So, in the well, we were trying to hear the people who were interviewed, although they they are quite often not asked for their perspectives. But we were also trying to hear how they sometimes objected. As for example, the Finnish migrants were often described in in Sweden as being always being drunk, always carrying a knife, starting a fight. So when you listen to the interviews or read the interviews because there are only transcripts uh, left, you can see that many of the interviewees, they don't want to al- uh, answer questions about uh, if they drink alcohol or if they answer, they say, no, I, I never drink alcohol or I rarely touch alcohol only on New Year's Eve and it's only champagne and it's, you know, they are trying to, create another narrative about the Finnish migrants in Sweden as being respectable, hard workers. Uh, so it's, wow. it's a different story. That's fabulous. So send me a couple of the articles in English. Like I, I'd be really interested. And there isn't enough, enough of that kind of work that's going on, like really deeply engaging with archived interviews, right? We always think we have to do new, new interviews, but I, I think we can learn a lot, like you were saying from, you know, from the past, so yeah. Cool. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to push us <laughs> beyond the time limit. Sorry, Mikhail. <laughs> no, 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 I think it's just because now, now I think that we could connect to the Nordic Museums because we cooperate with them also. So we, we might have a discussion for the, the next spring to, to, to open up for us. So that's good to hear that you have. Mikhail, I think, read the, a book back in the... I think there was someone from the audience. Yeah, to, sure. Uh, yeah. It was Lise Marie, if you, Elise Maris. 
Men det är så här, Lisa Marie, är du där? Vill du ställa den frågan live eller? Yes, I want to talk to you directly. Yeah. Uh, you hear me? Yeah. Um, thanks for the interesting conversation. Uh, I work as an ethnologist at the Sami Museum uh, in Norway. And we worked a lot over the border uh, to collect oral history on the both side in Norway and Sweden in the Lulesame area. And um, it's important to work with the, uh, our um, indigenous people. And we think it's, we must um, tell our own story and write our history because other researchers and people have studied us for hundreds of years. And it's, it's a way to take back our culture and history and language. So um, I think we work, as you talk about a lot about um, to collect and documenting uh, culture. So we, we document in our own culture. Such an important point. And I, I think oral history is not just a research methodology, but it's also a, a, well, in North America, we would say community building methodology. It's a way of, again, coming together. And, and, and like you're saying, in the context of uh, communities that have been, you know, marginalized or pushed down, you know, it's, it's all the more important or studied from outside. Um, that it's, it's a way to, to, sort of take back that control right of 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 remember of collectively remembering and i think i think world history you see that all around the world i think in canada you see that in, in a big way as well um, it's a very powerful example yeah. thanks for that question also that's something that we're gonna be able to to go on with when we make a bigger conference also as well I think Can I just say something to Lise Marie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Lise Marie. Nice, to, nice to hear your voice. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wondering, ha, have you been working with all the collections that are at the Nordic Museum about uh, about the Sami people? Because it would be really interesting to read a book and an article from from your perspective on those collections. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have studied the interviews and the material at Nordic Museum. We have used it in our exhibitions and articles. So I want to, to go further with that. Hmm. It's very important to, to, to discuss with the material, you can say, and, and, and put an, another perspective uh, because they have a kind of... Um, Förutfattad mening, uh, what you say in English. Free um, assumptions or quick uh, message. Yeah. So that's very important to, to, to work with different kinds of material. But I think my work is important to, to, to collect histories from people. They talk about their, mm. uh, their lives. Mm. It's important to write down because we have no written history in the Sami culture in the first place. We talk and telling stories to, 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 to each other. So that's why I'm so interesting to work with it. Sounds very, very important and interesting. Do you want, Lisa Marie, do you want to take contact with us after and say who, what you're doing? And so you can send an email to me or Tal. So we know knew you better. What what you're doing, so we can connect to you. Planning for yeah, it, it would be, be interesting. Yeah, to talk a bit with you. So I stay when we finished, or no, or, or if you just email Michael Morberg or or Tal Levinsky at the Multicultural Center, you can uh, okay. Then tell a little bit more of what what you're doing, and so so we can follow it up also as good good uh, suggestions in the end of this conversation that I started to close and then they come a lot of interesting contribution and then I have to listen and that's good because I learn more. 
it's exactly like an oral history interview. It never ends when you think it will. So. No. <laughs> okay, but I'm uh, I'm very glad that you could take this conversation together and also in this obviously heat that there are. So we see uh, we have summer here, and I I wish you a good summer. Uh, and uh, I I thank you very much for the advice and the and the I mean the reflection of what we are doing. And I think some of my colleagues also listen to this and this, we can also, as, as Tal said, we're gonna put this um, recording uh, so that other who wasn't with us this hour could, one and a half hour thing, it could listen afterwards. And I, th I really want to thank you and I want to cooperate with you uh, on the further process if you want to. Then I will listen more to what you have said, to say and I will also catch up what you have written also, I think. That's also important. So thank you and thank the audience who was with us this uh, uh, pre-sneak, what we're doing at Monte Culture Center. So I wish you, everybody, a nice summer and then uh, keep in touch so we can go back, do things together. Take care. Thank you for inviting us. It was very nice talking to you all. Bye. Bye.